Lydia. She lived in the town of Philippi in Greece. She was uh, representing her trade guild probably in the Roman colony of Philippi uh, in uh, modern day northern Greece, uh, the ancient uh, Roman province of Macedonia. As she was selling purple cloth, Lydia must have certainly been wealthy. We know there was a synagogue in Theatira, and uh, she probably uh, was a Gentile who became one of these God-fearers, uh, attracted to uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And uh, here she was now living in uh, Philippi. Her actions show she already believed in the only God, so she must have converted to Judaism. The book of Acts recounts the meeting between Lydia, the saleswoman, and Paul, the apostle, from Tarsus. Paul was traveling across Asia Minor and had gone to Greece to spread the message of the gospel, along with his assistants Silas and Timothy. One Sabbath, they leave the town, go beyond its borders, and head for the river bank. There they meet a group of women. Paul gets to the city where there was a very small Jewish community, mainly made up of women who were proselytes and probably not Jewish by birth. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. As they pray together, I think Paul sees her as a woman who's seeking after truth and uh, he begins to share about uh, Jesus and his message and she comes, uh, becomes a very early follower. She decided to convert to Christianity and got baptized along with her whole family. This was the start of the work in Philippi and the rest of Greece. If there's something I particularly like in the towns I travel through in Turkey, it is a friendly atmosphere of their bazaars. Enjoying a Turkish tea on this terrace, I realize that my investigation has suddenly taken a very interesting turn. In pulling together the scanty pieces of information provided by the text relating to Thyatira, I note that the Bible portrays two very different women. On the one hand, Revelation describes Jezebel sowing division in the church of Thyatira. On the other hand, the book of Acts showcases another woman, Lydia, portrayed as an exemplary in faith and obedience who played a significant role in the spread of Christianity in the area. She is the, you know, the opposite example of this Jezebel figure that we see, a, a woman who really models hospitality, holiness, uh, and uh, uh, one of the uh, very important early uh, women leaders in the church in the New Testament. I now need to understand who Jezebel was and what sort of threat she posed to the church of Thyatira. Jezebel is probably not her real name. She was someone who taught and bore great resemblance to the Jezebel of the Old Testament. Approximately nine centuries before the book of Revelation was written, a well-known Phoenician queen by the name of Jezebel reigned in Israel. King Ahab, ruler of the northern kingdom of Israel, had married her to set the seal on his alliance with Tyre, the greatest naval power of the time. Ahab was one of the bad kings of the northern kingdom, and God sent prophet after prophet uh, to call these kings to repentance. They did not listen. Of course, the instructions were not to marry a, a idolatrous uh, woman like Jezebel, but uh, Ahab did anyway. She was accused of being like the Egyptians, whose ways were popular at the time. And she went as far as changing worship in the temple in Jerusalem, from worshipping the God of Israel, Yahweh, to that of a typical Middle Eastern God called Baal. She had asked her husband to build a temple so she could carry out her own worship in a spirit of tolerance, as we would say today. And Ahab had agreed. The problem was that, at that time in the Northern Kingdom, the population was a mixture, including about 50% Canaanites, who had formerly worshipped Baal. We imagine that worship of Baal, Asherah, and other pagan gods was already commonplace in the land of Israel, before Ahab and Jezebel's rule. 
These were very ancient forms of worship that were widespread among the Canaanites. The god Baal and his female counterpart, the goddess Asherah, were idols of the earth and fertility. They were also the gods of rain and storms, and as such they were called upon across the ancient Middle East world to prosper harvests and the fruits of the earth. To ensure the land would be fruitful, they would visit sacred prostitutes. Intercourse between the worshipper and the sacred prostitute was supposed to make his fields, lands and so on fertile. So this type of worship was very popular because of the involvement of sacred prostitutes. Hence, the renewed interest in a return to Baal worship that had been stamped out when the children of Israel had arrived and taken over the land. Worship of the Lord had become significantly less popular. Jezebel did not hesitate in killing the prophets of the God of Israel and officially set up Baal worship through a bloody reign of terror. In response to King Ahab and Queen Jezebel's idolatry, the Lord sent the prophet Elijah to announce that there would be a drought throughout the land of Israel. In retaliation, Jezebel swore that she would kill Elijah, who had to flee into the desert to save his life. Later, Elijah cursed her by prophesying that she would face a wretched destruction, being devoured by dogs. This prophecy came to pass years later when a new king of Israel, Jehu, wiped out Ahab's family and killed all of his descendants. She comes to a very bad end because King Ahab's successor throws her out the window. We are told that chariots ride over her and dogs eat her remains. From a Middle Eastern point of view, the fact that the body no longer exists represents the most shameful death that could occur. Some time later, Jezebel became known as the personification of evil, especially for the early church. This is why we find the Jezebel of the Church of Thyatira depicted as a prostitute. Obviously, the author of Revelation intentionally chose this comparison between the false prophetess of Thyatira and this overbearing, idolatrous queen. Reference is made to a biblical historical figure, one that already had such symbolic significance in the Old Testament, and we use this image, uh, what the name represents, to help reveal something. Jezebel, we will never know her true identity, uh, she is a caricature of herself. She is now just Jezebel. And this is interesting. This is the reason for the symbolism in the book of Revelation. It uses images to help us see things. When John of Patmos says, no, this woman is Jezebel, he causes the mask to be removed and opens our eyes. It's a paradox that by covering things with a layer of symbolism, it actually exposes the reality. But what exactly did John of Patmos really say of her? The letter to Thyatira says the following. By her teachings, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. So we have a false prophetess by the name of Jezebel, who's in this church. She's a, a very strong woman uh, who is teaching uh, this message of accommodation. So we have two issues particularly, sexual immorality and food sacrifice to idols. And so they were somewhat connected. She was also involved in prostitution on two levels. Prostitution as per the real meaning of the word, and then idol worship, which is spiritual prostitution. So in the ancient world, uh, the restaurants often were at the pagan temples. Uh, and so uh, union uh, uh, groups, uh, the ancient trade guilds would have their meetings there as well. So this becomes one of the issues. The food that's being consumed has been offered to a pagan god or goddess. As a Christian, can you go to this? where they would be eating, then there would be sexual fornication taking place in these same places. So for the Greeks and Romans, uh, immorality was very common. And so the, the mixing of eating and sexual immorality was a, a, a real problem. Jezebel, this woman, uh, he's called this, is uh, advocating that this is all right. So this is the tension we see here in this letter. Jezebel was combining pagan and Christian influences in the church by encouraging Christian involvement in the debauchery of pagan festivals. She was encouraging the Christian craftsmen and traders of the town, torn between faithfulness to Christ and financial interest, to con